book of Revelation, uh, chapter 4. Book of Revelation, chapter 4. We've been moving through this book um, for a while now. I believe this is like our tenth sermon in here so far. We could stand for the reading of God's Word. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet, speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we have in your scriptures this morning. We pray that you use this for good in our lives. Hallelujah. We thank you, O Lord, that we can take time to study your word, even in this important book called Revelation. And God, I just ask and pray that you would help me to set forth that which you've given me to declare this day and glorify yourself through it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You could be seated. In verse 1, the scripture says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Believe it or not, This is a major key verse for the pre-tribulation rapture theory. In fact, it is this verse that the entire theory is built upon. It is this verse the entire theory is built upon. The popular eschatological view in American Christianity, the pre-tribulation rapture theory, says that the rapture takes place here in verse 1. The rapture takes place here in verse 1. Do you see it? No, you don't, do you? That's because, like so many of the verses the futurists use to try and prove their pre-tribulation rapture theory, when you look at the passages or verse and exegete them, they have nothing to do with what they are saying it has to do with. They are committing what we call eisegesis. They are reading something into the text That is not there. Now, why do they say that this is where the rapture took place? Well, let me give you three of their reasons. They are their reasons why they say the rapture took place here. The first is because they say it speaks here of a trumpet. Of a trumpet. And they say, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, keep your finger here in Revelation, and let's turn there and look at it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, talks about how there will be a trumpet when Christ returns. It says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. So, since there's going to be this trumpet there when Christ returns, that means that since this verse here in chapter 4, verse 1, speaks of a trumpet, that the rapture has taken place. There's some problems with that view, however. One is, a trumpet is commonly associated in Scripture with the Lord communicating to His people. The trumpet is commonly used in association in Scripture with God communicating to His people, especially in times of judgment, as is the case here in the book of Revelation. So just because... Just because verse 1 here of chapter 4 mentions the trumpet doesn't mean the rapture is taking place. You have to impose that upon the text. Not only that, but it doesn't say that it was a trumpet. Like it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. It doesn't say it was a trumpet. It says it was as a trumpet or like a trumpet. Okay? The Greek here is os salpagas. It means as a trumpet or like a trumpet. All right? Now, if you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, you may recall we have the same thing being said there where John says here in Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. As of a trumpet. Again, os. Salopagos. Same Greek words, same Greek syntax. Just because it's trumpets mentioned there, why don't we then say that this is where the rapture took place? Or perhaps we have a double rapture. One took place in 110 because we have the trumpet mentioned there, and now the rapture, another one's taking place in chapter 4, verse 1, because the trumpet's mentioned there. Again, it's clear that it's not a trumpet, it's a voice like a trumpet. Both places. So you have to want to impose upon the text this idea that a rapture has taken place by the mere fact that the word trumpet is mentioned. Do you know how insane that is? When it comes to exegetical work, it's beyond the pale. Now, that isn't the only thing they bring up in order to try and convince you that chapter 4, verse 1 is talking about the rapture. They then say, because it says, come up here to John, because it says, come up here, that means the rapture has taken place. Come up here means the rapture has taken place. The problem with that view, imposing the rapture upon the mere words, come up here, The problem is the text is clear that John alone was being addressed with the intention of him seeing a vision of future events. You have to want to believe it is talking about the rapture to get that out of the text. It is not the clear teaching of the text. They impose their idea upon the text. And those who want to believe it or want to have someone else do all their thinking for them, believe what is clearly not there. The emperor has no clothes. It's not there. It's made up. They're bringing it upon the text. And the third thing they say, why this is talking about the rapture, is they say because starting in verse 1 of chapter 4, all the way until Revelation 22, verse 16, the church... That term, the church, is never used again. Meaning the church has been removed from the scene. The rapture has taken place. That's why the word church isn't used from this point on until Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. Just because the term church isn't used, you get to say that's because it's been raptured? Do you know how insane that is? how inane that is, how ridiculous that is when it comes to exegetical work. We could make up all kinds of things and impose things in by virtue of what isn't there, if that's how we want to do our exegetical work. 
Are you starting to get the picture why I threw off dispensational pre-tribulation rapturism over 20 years ago? This is the type of nonsense you have to embrace to get it to work. The fact is, John only uses the term church, quote-unquote, in all his writings to refer to a particular congregation, never to the church universal, as what is being dealt with in Revelation 4 all the way to the end. He only uses the term church in all his writings to refer to a particular congregation, as was just done in the last two chapters of Revelation where we have the seven letters to the seven churches. My point is simple. The rapture is not seen in verse 1 unless you want to put it there, unless you want to impose that upon the text. If you allow the text to just speak clearly as it is speaking, it is not there. It is not in verse 1. As you clearly saw when you approached it and just looked at it for what it had to say. No, it wasn't there. They impose their ideas upon the text to convince people that it is there. And they do it ad nauseum so that when people read this verse, they automatically put it in their mind that it's there. Because they've heard that so many times throughout their life. Now, let's move on here in the passage. John is going to see a vision a future event. And here he gets a glimpse of heaven. He's come up into heaven to see the vision of future events. And here he gets a view of what heaven is like. And he tells us about it. Look at verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven. That's where he is. And one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. When you read John's description of what he saw when he was in heaven, most all this imagery is found in Old Testament passages where you got a glimpse into heaven during Old Testament times, too, in various passages, which we'll look at some later on. But I don't want to go through them all and show you, see, this is where this part is in the Old Testament, because you will fall asleep on me. Okay? So I'm, I won't do that to you, okay? But like the throne, the lightnings and thunderings, remember when they met God at the mountain with Moses and all the people? There was lightnings and thunderings. Anyways, all these things are from Old Testament imagery. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Now, here we have John revealing what heaven looks like. Now, let me digress here for a moment. And let's look at a passage which people commonly refer to and say it's talking about heaven. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 2.9. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. A popular verse which is often applied to heaven. It says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And almost every time I've ever heard this verse mentioned, people are saying it is talking about heaven. We don't know how wonderful it's going to be, how glorious it's going to be. The Scripture says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. We just don't know how great it's going to be. Well, we kind of do. Because <laughs> not only do we have it here in Revelation with John, but in other places throughout the Bible where heaven is revealed. We at least get a glimpse or a good look at what heaven's going to be like, what's going on there in the throne room of God. 
And the truth of the matter is, exegetically, this verse, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, is not talking about heaven. You do realize that, right? The very next verse says, but God has revealed them to us. By virtue of that fact alone, you know it ain't talking about heaven. It's talking about something that's been revealed to us already. You know what it is? It's the covenant. It's Christ and Him crucified. How a man obtains right standing with God and salvation from Him. That is what was being referred to when it says, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. Those of us who know Him, amen, have had that great salvation revealed to us. And how do you know that it's talking about the covenant? How a man obtains right standing with God? That it's talking about Christ and Him crucified? By looking at the context. You can't just take a verse out and then apply it willy-nilly. And that's what people do. They take this verse out and apply it willy-nilly to heaven. Foolishly. But if you look at it in its context, it's talking about God's great salvation. Look at verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. What is the wisdom of God? Chapter 1, verse 24. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is Christ and Him crucified. That's the whole context of what's being talked about here when this verse is brought up. Go all the way back to chapter 1 and verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Amen? This is the context of what he's talking about. It's the covenant, the great salvation that is provided through Christ. That's what man doesn't see when it's talking about that in verse 9 of chapter 2. But we do see those of us who have been saved, as it says in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look how it goes on here and talks about it. Uh, verse 30, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glorifies, let him glory in the Lord. He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And I, brother, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And what is the power of God? As we saw in chapter 1, verse 24, it is Christ crucified. Amen? The power of God and the wisdom of God. That's who Christ is. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, His great plan of salvation, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Why? Because that's how people got saved. <laughs> Jesus died on the cross and shed His blood so we can obtain right standing with Him. Amen? What's being talked about here? The covenant. The great salvation. And then He says, As it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. Human wisdom can't reveal it to that. 
only the preaching of the gospel and them believing the preaching of the gospel. And that's why he says in verse 10, but God has revealed them to you through his spirit. So I just want to digress there a little bit to point out that this passage is not talking about heaven. What God has prepared for us in that regard, when we go to heaven, we have glimpses or looks in Scripture of that. So even on that basis alone, you know, chapter 2, verse 9 can't be talking about that. And then when you look at it contextually, it clearly isn't talking about heaven. It's talking about the covenant, the great salvation that God provides for us. Now go back to Revelation, chapter 4. We made it up to verse 6, and let's continue on with our look at heaven. Verse 7 says, The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. These are things you don't commonly see on earth. you agree with that? Kind of interesting. In verse 8 it goes on and says, The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holiness. One of the greatest attributes of the Lord is holiness. Exodus 15.11 says He is glorious in holiness. Remember singing that song years ago? Some of the older people. Glorious in holiness. Exodus 15:11. He is set apart. He's different from man and the nature of man. So holy is God that these four creatures do not rest day or night, but continually declare, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Day and night. And as His people, He also desires holiness in our lives. Hebrews 12.10 says that He chastens us, quote, that we may be partakers of His holiness. That we may be partakers of His holiness. 1 Peter 2.9 says we are, quote, a holy nation, a peculiar people, unquote. 2 Corinthians 7.1 says we are to be, quote, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. One of God's greatest attributes is His holiness. And we as His people are to demonstrate that holiness in the earth by how we conduct our lives. We are a picture of the Lord to people. Epistles of Him written and known by all men by virtue of the way we conduct our lives. God is holy. Think you're good. Think you're doing good. Get in the presence of God. Spend time drawing close to Him. And you'll see and taste His holiness. And you'll see how truly unholy you really are. Want to know what you'll think and say once you taste His holiness? Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 64, verses 6 and 7. If you want to know what you'll think and say once you taste His holiness, you won't arrogantly be thinking you're better than most other Christians. Want to know what you'll think and say? Here's what it says. But we are all like an unclean thing. Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. This is what you're left thinking about yourself when you get into the presence of a holy God. And that's what the context is talking about, His presence. Look at verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, 
that the mountains might shake at your presence. As fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries that the nations may tremble at your presence. You get in the presence of a holy God, the end result is a true rendering of your state. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Look what Isaiah says of himself when he found himself in the very presence of God. In the very throne room of God. In heaven itself. In the year that King Isaiah died, chapter 6, verse 1, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Right? Six wings. It's like these other beings we just read about in Revelation. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone. This is the end result. This is what you're left saying of yourself when you get in the presence of a holy God. Holiness is one of his greatest attributes, and he desires us to be holy in our lives. And when you spend time in his presence, you get a true taste of just how holy he is. And it leaves you getting a true evaluation of your state. Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's what happens when you get in the presence of a holy God. We need to take time to spend in God's presence. God is holy. May we perfect holiness in the fear of God in our lives that we may be used by Him and bring glory to Him in the earth. Amen? Now let's go back here in Revelation chapter 4. Continue on. We have three more verses. We're looking at heaven, what things were going on there. And it says in verse 9, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, Whenever they did that, which they did day and night, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Isn't that amazing? I don't know how often they did it, you know. It says they're doing it day and night. Who knows how often they were doing it. But every time they did it, the elders and the 24 elders would fall down before the Lord cast their crowns towards the throne and sing this song. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Verse 11 reveals to us who we were created by and what we were created for. We were created by God with the purpose of bringing glory to Him. Before I was a Christian, I wondered, why am I here? I think every person has that come to their mind at some point in their life. For me, it was age seven, sitting in my parents' bathroom with a razor to my wrist, because at that young age, I already knew life here was a joke, and there had to be something more to earth in my being here than what I saw with my eyes. And as I got older and continued to watch the vanity of life, went into drugs and immorality, because I saw nothing to live for here on earth. 60 or 70 years of getting high all the time, going to work, 
getting a girl now and then, taking two weeks of vacation out of the year, retiring. You do that 60 or 70 years and then you're dead? And that's it? That's what these people on planet Earth think their life is. And they're happy with it. I never was. Never was. Knew there had to be something more to life than this that I saw with my eyes. And I wondered what it was. And when the day came that I repented and believed in Jesus Christ, turned from my sin and believed in Him, and came to know Him, and was radically transformed by His Spirit, became born again, a new person, at that very moment, one of my first thoughts was, this is why I was created. To live to bring glory to God. He created me. And this is the purpose for which I exist. To glorify Him in the earth. And we do that by living in accordance with His Word. Amen? The way we glorify God through our lives is by living in obedience to His Word. By living in conformity to His revealed will in Scripture. This verse reveals to us that the creation exists. Listen to me now. Verse 11 reveals to us that the creation exists not because God needed to create or because He is dependent upon His creation in any way, but simply because it was His will to create. It pleased Him to do so. Amen? Extremely important for us to understand. The idea that God needed to create or is somehow dependent upon His creation is a thought played upon by arrogant man. Rebellious man who wants a controllable God, one which he can belittle and use for his own ends. They sit around at the university campuses pondering such things. Ad nauseum. And Hollywood runs around proffering such things through films ad nauseum. A plethora of verses make it clear he did not need to create or is somehow dependent upon his creation. Let's look at just two verses because we could go on for a long time. Two verses. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 17. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 17. All nations, the scripture reads, before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. (laughs) Does that sound like a God who needed to create? who is somehow dependent upon his creation for his own existence? No, it doesn't, does it? The Scriptures are clear. It was his will to create. It pleased him to do so. Brought him pleasure to do so. But he didn't need to do it. And he's not dependent on us for his existence. As arrogant man and rebellious man is teaching to this generation ad nauseum at the universities and through Hollywood's media. Totally contrary to Scripture. He counts the nations less than nothing and worthless. Look at Acts chapter 17. This will be our other verse we look at. Acts 17, verse 24 and 25. The book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 24 and 25. Look what the Scripture says here. God, who made the world and everything in it. That's right. He created at all. God, who made the world and everything in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything. Since He gives to all life, breath, and all things. God didn't need to create. He is not dependent upon his creation for his own existence, as arrogant man teaches today. The truth of the matter is, it was his will to create. 
And he was pleased to do it. That's what the scriptures teach. You, brothers and sisters, were created by God with the purpose of glorifying Him in the earth. I could give you again a list of passages we could go on and look at for the next hour and 45 minutes where scriptures make it clear that is why you exist, to glorify Him. But let me just give you this one. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatever you do. That covers it all. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. May His name be praised to our lives. Let's stand up and we'll close in prayer. Hallelujah, Father. We give thanks and praise to You, Lord. We thank You, O Lord. We thank You for this look into heaven and to what they're singing in praise and adoration of You there. We look forward to the day when we join with all the saints and worship You, gather around Your throne and sing these songs along with these creatures and these 24 elders. O Lord, be glorified, we pray, through our lives. Praise Your holy name. May we put off the sin which so easily encumbers us, O God. And may we perfect holiness in the fear of You. Blessed be Your holy name. We were created, O God, to bring glory to You. And may we live according to that purpose all the days of our lives in every area of our life, O God. And may we call others and nations to live in conformity with your holy word. Empower us by your Holy Spirit to do so. And when we declare it, may your Holy Spirit be convicting the hearers of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And may we see peoples and nations won and brought into conformity of your holy law. And word. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. May you be praised. Amen. Amen. Praise His holy name. Amen. You could be seated. We're going to take communion at this time. And um, you can feel free to take communion with us as long as you're a Christian. You don't have to be a member of this church or something like that to take communion here at Mercy Seat. But you do need to be a believer. You have to have repented and believed in Christ. Because this is something that is only for believers to observe, namely the Lord's table. Here at Mercy Seat, we observe the Lord's table every week that we gather. And we do this for a number of reasons. One reason is because it's the tradition of the church to do so. It was the pattern laid out by the early church to observe the Lord's table every week that they gathered. And so we follow in that blueprint, that pattern laid out by the early church. And we, too, observe His table every week that we gather. And probably the most paramount reason that we observe His table every week is because we need to be reminded of how we obtain right standing with God, that it's always only through faith in Christ. And that's what his table reminds us of. Because there's only two elements at his table. The bread which represents his body and the fruit of the vine which represents his shed blood. And nothing else. Those are the only two elements at his table. And we as men need that. See, man wants to think he obtains right standing with God somehow through his own self-effort. Western man often thinks it's through his good works. Do enough good works and they outweigh my bad good, my bad works and boing, I'm good with God. I'm going to glory. And of course the standard of goodness just keeps getting lower and lower. In fact, if you go on the campuses these days, the only one going to hell is Adolf Hitler. Everybody else is going to make it in. That's what man thinks. If I'm good enough, God will accept me. 
It's a lie. We can never be good enough to be accepted of God. That's why Jesus died on the cross. Because we've all sinned. And He took our place. He bore our sins. So that if we will believe in Him, turn from our sin and believe in Him, we can obtain forgiveness of our sin and have right standing with God. You'll actually taste His holiness, His love, His presence. You'll have what we call communion with Him. Praise His holy name. But even after we become a Christian, we can come to the point where we start thinking, well, I'm saved through faith in Jesus, but, you know, I've got to do this, 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 and that in order to obtain right standing with God. That's a lie. You can always only obtain God's acceptance through Christ alone. Whether you've been a Christian for five seconds or 55 years, it will always be the same. We get to meet with God through Christ alone plus nothing. And this time at his table reminds us of that holy fact. Because again, there's only two elements at his table. The fruit of the vine which represents his shed blood and the bread which represents his body. It isn't these two elements plus a list of how many hours I spent in prayer or how many old ladies I helped cross the street. No, it's just these two elements. Now, when you know Christ, you'll want to spend hours in prayer. You'll want to help elderly women across the street. You'll want to do good works. The point is, is that those good works that we do, they're the result of our saving faith in Christ. They're the evidence of our saving faith in Christ. They're the fruit of our saving faith in Christ. We don't do those good things to try and obtain God's acceptance. Rather, we do those good things because we have obtained God's acceptance. And there's a world of difference between those two. And we need to keep that in remembrance. This time at his table reminds us of it. It's through Christ alone that he accepts us. Praise his holy name. This is a great salvation. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread... And drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Our sole approach to God is through Christ and him crucified. Amen? Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Father, we thank you for the great salvation you have provided us with. We thank you that you redeemed us, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with your own precious blood. Praise your holy name. We deserve death, and you died in our stead. So that if we will believe in you, we can be born again. Become new creatures who live our lives in utter devotion and fealty to you. May we do exactly that, all those of us who have been redeemed. Praise your holy name, O God. Help us to be your ambassadors this coming week and to declare to the nations your holy law and this great salvation. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. Hallelujah. Praise His name. Let's stand and we'll worship for a minute. Hallelujah, Lord. All praise and honor to You, O God. Worthy is Your holy name. Praise Your name, Lord. Father, I ask and pray that this week we live our lives as a holy nation, as a peculiar people, a people of Your possession, ones who talk about You, 
ones who talk about you. But while the world is talking about utter nonsense, vanity, and stupidity, may we open our mouths this week and talk about something of substance. May we declare to others, you. May we preach your truth to others this coming week. And boldness by your Holy Spirit to open our mouths and to speak, to not be fearful, concerned about reputation, prideful, but to be your ambassadors. In Jesus' name we ask, Father. Amen. Praise His holy name.